It's six o'clock and time for Even Song at Home for the second week of Hillary term. This week, we continue our celebration of George Herbert. We'll have a conversation around his first poem on prayer, and we'll sing the hymn version of his King of Glory, King of Peace. But there are other poets waiting for us this evening too. First, the poets of the biblical Psalms and Canticles. The Psalms are intimate conversations with God along the whole spectrum of human emotion. And our Psalm this evening, Psalm 30, goes very well with our featured Herbert poem, Prayer is the Church's Banquet, because it shows the kind of prayer that Herbert describes in action. Tonight, we will also add a fourth poet into the mix, a poet theologian of our own time, the Reverend Tess Ward, whose volume, The Celtic Wheel of the Year, will provide the basis for our prayers. So thank you for watching, and all of us at Wadham Chapel hope that you will find something in this half hour of poetry, song, and prayer to raise your spirits and brighten your week. Welcome to Evensong. The psalm appointed for this evening is Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have raised me up and have not let my foes triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you have healed me. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored me to life from among those that go down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you servants of his. Give thanks to his holy name. For his wrath endures but the twinkling of an eye, his favour for a lifetime. Heaviness may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. You, Lord, of your goodness, have made my hill so strong. Then... You hid your face from me, and I was utterly dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried. To the Lord I made my supplication. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O oh hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me, O Lord. Be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Therefore my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Amen. The lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, 
he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Thanks be to God. Our poem for a second week is George Herbert's sonnet, Prayer Number One. And our talk is going to be a discussion between myself and modern undergraduate Josie Edis, who is studying modern languages. So welcome, Josie. First, we're going to read the poem and you're going to see it on the screen. You won't see us anymore. You will just see the poem for the duration so that you'll be able to follow it. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, 
the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth. Engine against the almighty, sinner's tower, reversed thunder, Christ's side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear. Softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, exalted manna, gladness of the best, heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise. Church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. So I think overall, what really strikes me in this poem is the musicality of it. And if it were a symphony or a concerto, you could see that each stanza is really its own little movement with its own rhythm and pace and um, mood. So the first one starts out with this lovely, uh, well-paced sort of moderato prayer, the church's banquet. It's a very stately opening overture. And then the second stanza, is almost like a, a martial, uh, allegro, military march, engine against the almighty, reverse thunder, the pace is, is very fast. And then you come to the third movement, this beautiful andante, which just sings with softness and peace and gladness and blessing. And then it all cruises into this beautiful um, conclusion, rallentando, with the church bells beyond the stars heard and the land of spices, something understood. So it has a, a hugely musical sensibility, like all of Herbert's poems. And it really breathes in each, each stanza, you can feel the heart beating within the stanzas. So that's my first overall sense. Yeah, I think my first overall sense, um, when reading it is that the expectation that we or maybe I had, um, seeing the title prayer, um, it's perhaps one of a very contained, quiet, dutiful, um, conventional kneeling down prayer. And then the whole poem just absolutely blows apart any um, notions of prayer being confined in that way um, and talks about it as something really powerful and quite violent, um, actually, at times. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's why I love it. It can really change your perception. I think that's exactly right. It, it just crackles with energy. It's not that static sitting quietly in your room. It's, it's besieging the kingdom of heaven with a siege engine. It's, it's throwing God's thunder back up to God. It's arguing with God. It's um, full, of, full of this amazing uh, dynamic connection up and down. God sends thunder to the earth but we're sending thunder back up to god and god's breath that he breathed into adam is we're breathing back up to god it's that plumb line that's being dropped into the ocean just to see just how deep it is and realizing that we can sound the depth between heaven and earth it's not that far away and herbert is is so good at um at the immediacy of the connection that is opened up when we pray yeah, I think that's particularly evident um, and particularly powerfully phrased in the line, heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, um, because it gives this wonderful personification of heaven, kind of wearing ordinary clothes um, alongside man being robed in kind of celestial heavenly clothes. Uh, and just that prayer makes that happen and kind of brings heaven down to earth a little bit more and earth up to heaven and brings them kind of alongside each other. And uh, man well dressed, don't you just have this image of, of wearing your best spangly garment and your best sort of paradise feathered bird outfit and uh, that wonderful juxtaposition of the absolutely extraordinary and the absolutely ordinary. I think that's, that's part of the key to this poem, which is all about sort of topsy turves topsy-turvy reversals and, um, and upending of expectations. I, I can't resist because I'm a historian and a pedant, just adding one little footnote here that, that ordinary apparently in the 17th century was a term for 
a um, fixed price meal in a tavern. And so in a sense, God is coming down to have chicken and chips with us at the King's Arms. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet God is also inviting us up to high table. So, and both of those things are good and they're intimately connected. I think Herbert is so much the, the poet of an intimate connection and, and an invitation, intimate invitation. Yeah, I think looking at the poem kind of as a whole, um, it's amazing how the journey we go on to all of these exotic places and images um, and kind of the, the pilgrimage of the heart that he talks about and the soul in paraphrase, which almost feels like the soul's been packaged into words to be sent out um, up to heaven in the prayer. Um, but it's amazing how at the very last line, it comes right back to ourself, to something understood um, and that maybe the highest gift of, of prayer, despite all of these kind of marvelous and delicacies in between, is actually the personal experience and the, the kind of personal revelation that it can bring almost in a mystical sense um, that all of these external things come back to our intimate self. So that's a great place to end. Maybe we could end by just reading the last couplet. I'll, I'll do the first line and you do the second line. Church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood. The land of spices, something understood.
George Herbert's poem on prayer describes embodied prayer that engages all the senses. We can see the many vivid images such as the Milky Way and the birds of paradise, smell the fragrance of the land of spices, hear the church bells ringing beyond the stars, taste the exalted manna, and feel in our bodies our breath returning to heaven, the steady beating of our heart in pilgrimage, and we can wince at the sharp pain of the side-piercing spear. Tess Ward, in her book of prayers, The Celtic Wheel of the Year, takes us on many embodied prayer pilgrimages. And here is one from her prayer sequence for Fridays in January, entitled Journeys. I would like to think that her characterization of God as embodied love caught between heaven and earth is one on which Herbert himself would smile. So let us pray. Blessed be you, keeper of our past, guider of our stories, holder of our secrets. Embodied God, on the ladder between the home of heaven and earth's dwelling place, the crack between the worlds, a baby journeyed, belonging to both. Come, embodied love, to my hands, that I might that my touch might soothe, to my ears, that I might receive words of kindness, to my belly, that I might have the courage to go beyond, to my journey, that I might be aware of a purpose, to my feet, that I might always treasure the earth that supports me, to my heart, that I might live for more than myself. Come, embodied love, caught between heaven and earth, at home in both, walk with me in my traveling this day. Amen. Pilgrim God, who had nowhere to rest your head, be with those without home who know no comfort, and those who are not at home inside their own skin, for whom the indoor fairy-lit season reminds of wounds, of unrecaptured pastimes, or times never felt. I hold before you particularly this day. And so we remember all those known to us who are restless, homeless, seeking purpose in any need or trouble. Offer us fireside moments of place or presence where we feel the sweet glimmer of a home within. Amen.
Our blessing this night is also from the poet theologian Tess Ward. Watch for themes of the epiphany season, the wise men following the star, and the wise men being told in a dream to return home by another way. So let us bow our heads. May the God who hangs her star over unexpected places lure us to the place we need to be, where new things must happen and we have to return home by another way. Bless us this day as we let go into your peace. Amen. <laughs>